So perhaps it's fitting now that we hear from Lord Newberger. He's a former president of the Supreme Court. It's only fitting, therefore, that he talk tonight about the, the rule of law and democracy. Please do welcome him onto the stage. Please welcome Lord Newberger. I suppose there are two fundamental foundation stones on which any modern civilized society rests. The rule of law and democracy. Freedom of expression and other fundamental rights are, of course, essential. But without the underlying structure of democracy and the rule of law, those rights will wither away, as would other features of modern life which we rather take for granted. Public order, social security, free health, free education, and so on. So far, so simple. Every country, of course, has its own rules and principles about the way in which democratic government is formed and is run, and what its powers are, and what its legal system can and can't do, and how it should do it. But the United Kingdom is almost unique in the modern democratic world in having no coherent overriding constitution, which, for instance, enables judges to override parliament when it's acted unconstitutionally. Parliament has no such fetter in our system. Our constitutional principles are of the make-it-up-as-you-go-along variety. And similarly, as we've also recently learnt, even the procedural rules of the House of Commons are largely what the Speaker decides they are. But it's not just the rules that matter. At least equally important, it's the people who matter. A society based on the rule of law uh, and on democracy depends on public confidence in the system. Because a civilized system of government ultimately rests on public consent, on public respect. Obvious examples are the losing party accepting an election result, or the losing litigant accepting a court's decision. If public confidence in the system is fatally undermined, you can have all the well thought out rules and laws you could wish for, but the system will fail and anarchy or worse will take over. We've got to watch for that. Now, Great Britain is almost unique in another way. We've had over 300 years of existence without any successful invasion, without any tyranny, and without any revolution. And as far as our home record is concerned, we can justly pride ourselves on being a leading global force for centuries in promoting democracy, the rule of law, and decency uh, through peaceful, pragmatic progress. But as a result of our success and our good fortune, I think we've become rather complacent about the solidity of our system. We've taken it for granted, and that can be very dangerous. History shows that it can be all too easy for a country to lose its way, for a decent, civilized government to, to be replaced by a repressive totalitarian regime like Germany in the 1930s. And indeed, the very tolerance of a decent government renders it easier to undermine the government, just as a repressive government can make it difficult to dislodge it, even if its time looks well and truly up, as in Venezuela. Now, the challenges uh, we face today arise in part from problems which other countries face as well. Uh, the fallout from the 2008 banking crisis, inequality, perceived and actual, immigration, reaction to liberal values, unprecedented technological changes, especially in communications. But there are UK-specific factors which have had discom discombobulated our political system. Our political situation seems to have changed very quickly from enviable stability to worrying instability following the June 2016 referendum. But I would suggest that the effect of the referendum and its aftermath have been reinforced by the potentially destabilizing effect of substantial changes in our constitutional setup introduced over the past 20 years. We've had devolution legislation which has turned the UK into a quasi-federal country. We've had the Human Rights Act, which gave us a quasi-constitution. We've had reform of the House of Lords, which changed our legislature. We've had removal of the Lord Chancellor, whereby we lost a reliable, independent voice for the rule of law. We've had freedom of information, which introduced a new dimension of open government. 
And for the first time in over 160 years of peace, we've had a coalition government. All that can be quite discombobulating. When one turns to the referendum of 2016, I would say that referendums are a somewhat alien novelty in a system with no formal constitution and with parliamentary supremacy. Under our system, the will of the people is expressed through electing MPs who vote in Parliament, and Parliament has been supreme with no constitutional fetter, as I've mentioned. Unlike, for instance, Switzerland, we have no tradition, let alone any rules, telling us how referenda fit in with our well-entrenched rules of representative democracy and parliamentary supremacy. Until 2016, there had been two UK-wide referendums which had presented no problems as the results had reflected the prevailing parliamentary view. And the same was true of the Scottish and Welsh referenda we had. However, when, as in, 19, in 2016, a national referendum produces a result which does not reflect what the MPs generally think, trouble ensues, particularly when the issue concerned is constitutional and multifaceted. I have to say that things were not helped by the dismal quality of the political debate during the referendum. Even to those cynical uh, about the level of political debate generally, this was a low point. The Remainers lazily confident in the main, mounting a negative campaign based on overstated fears bordering at times on hysteria. The Leavers, mostly knowing that individually they wouldn't have to deliver even if they won, relied on a combination of unrealistic threats and Pied Piper promises. Another serious threat, another serious problem, I beg your pardon, was that the Brexit referendum was an unguided missile. Parliament left a vacuum in the statute when it came to stating what the effect of a Leave vote would be. This was in stark contrast with the 2014 Scottish Independence Referendum Act, where Parliament spelt out the consequences and the timetable of an independence vote. Indeed, as a matter of strict law, the EU referendum had no effect. Politically, this vacuum has been filled by a mass of dissonant, passionate voices because there are, uh, as has been pointed out, a large number of perfectly legitimate views as to the terms upon which we should leave the EU and the terms of the relationship thereafter. And as every alternative leaves us worse off than the status quo, at least for the foreseeable future, it's scarcely surprising that there's no majority for any solution. Furthermore, very unusually, Brexit is a major political issue which does not split people along party lines. This makes for a very uncomfortable situation in the House of Commons, which has historically been closely whipped and where throughout the past century, uh, the executive has rarely faced parliamentary rebellions, let alone defeats. And it also makes things uncomfortable when it comes to campaigning in the country, as political fights have almost always uh, been under party umbrellas. I neither want nor have the time to discuss uh, the Brexit-related debates and votes in Westminster over the past three years, but it's scarcely controversial to suggest that they've done nothing to enhance the reputation of or confidence in our constitutional system in the minds of the general public. And the almost theological nature of the Brexit discussion has served to polarize opinions and inflame passions. In 2015, under 5% of the UK population thought EU membership was the most important issue facing government. Now it has rocketed to 50% and is seen to be the most important issue by more than three times as many people as the next most important issue, the NHS. Having said that, I readily acknowledge that politics can be a very difficult exercise, and that's particularly true when it comes to Brexit. A number of the actions that are now criticised in connection with Brexit, carried out by the government, received general support, or at any rate, very little criticism at the time. And a number of the problems following the referendum have no good answer. One feeling which I rather unexpectedly came away with after eight years as a senior judge uh, was sympathy for politicians when it came to media coverage. 
It's no exaggeration to say uh, that there is relentless partisan, grossly oversimplified, not infrequently positively misleading coverage of political issues. It seems to be a persistent feature of modern life. By contrast, judges have suffered less from the media, and when they do suffer, the attacks rarely last more than a day or two. Nevertheless, uh, there were inappropriate attacks on the judges, the worst example of which, of course, is, was the scurrilous Daily Mail enemies of the people front page following the uh, Article 50 decision. To be fair, that seems to have been something of a one-off, but it was almost more notable for the lamentable government reaction, suggesting that to create a newspaper would infringe freedom of expression a ludicrous and self-contradictory proposition. The enemies of the people saga is nonetheless a relatively extreme example, but nonetheless an example of the approach of many newspapers when it comes to political or constitutional issues. They are more concerned with propaganda than with news, more interested in sensationalism rather than accuracy. So I fear that many newspapers are also contributing uh, to a lack of confidence in all the aspects of our constitutional system. But I would suggest that people in public life do contribute to this. In many cases by conducting deniable, off-the-record briefings to journalists, and sometimes by condoning unacceptable behavior in the name of freedom of the press. I wonder whether many such off-the-record briefings are in the public interest. And far from justifying bad behavior, surely freedom of the press carries responsibilities. Of course, one of the main reasons why the traditional media are so febrile is that they are being squeezed massively by the electronic media. Newspaper circulation over the past 20 years uh, has reduced by 50% in some cases, the case of some newspapers, by 75%. And of course, uh, the, electron when the, the, the effect of the electronic media and the problems for democracy and the rule of law raised by blogs, tweets, and other form of messaging makes the problems I've been describing in relation to the traditional media almost pale into significance. For reasons of financial gain, political fanaticism, a desire to destabilize the system, and sometimes sheer mischievousness, electronic messaging is being used on an increasing scale to carry inflammatory misinformation, cynically catering to prejudices and cruelly preying on ignorance, all targeted and timed in a way in which a 20th century propagandist could only have dreamt of. On top of that, many people seem to regard tweeting as an opportunity to make valent and untrue, indeed positively criminal threats and statements. Electronic communications seem to engender a sort of disembodied shamelessness among many people. While censorship, blocking and removal of messages is unattractive and not without practical difficulties, and we certainly don't want to go the way of China, I suggest that we, in society, politicians, lawyers, have a positive duty to take, take steps to fight back against this assault on our constitutional system, indeed, on our whole way of life. As I mentioned at the start of this talk, democracy and the rule of law can only work in a society where the constitutional arrangements are generally accepted and respected. The various factors I've mentioned have caused many people to lose confidence in our system. Uh, and to look sometimes to other uh, less enlightened forms of government than we have currently enjoyed. The fact that we have such a make-it-up-as-you-go-along constitution has the advantage of greater flexibility, which is of significant value in a fast-changing world. But given the value of having something solid and secure to hold on at times of trouble and challenge, uh, such a constitution can be something of a disadvantage. I should like to end by making it clear that it's not by any means all doom and gloom. For instance, there are still many more people wanting to come to the UK than wanting to leave, even from the EU. We are disproportionately successful in all areas of scientific research and in the number of outstanding universities we have. On many global measures such as the Corruption Perception Index or Democratic Index, we do well. 
We are very big in technology startups, and we are very successful in financial and legal services. And more specifically, as I've mentioned, our consistent political and governmental success over the past 300 years should stand us in good stead, at least if we don't turn around and kick it in the face. Thank you very much. <laughs>